Stay hungry, stay foolish. I want to thank our sponsor, Zai Boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. We've a lot to discuss. Let's get into it. One of the goals of this show is that we all get to maximize our lives that we get the most that is possible out of this life and that we make the best decisions possible. And the question we asked you in part one of this show was, imagine you could do that when you were sleeping, imagine you could divine meaning and purpose and figure out really difficult questions, what the answers to those questions are. And our guest today proposes that yes, you can and yes, you can do this when you sleep. And he offers a program and a book that takes us through how to do that. I've been doing it since we started this program. and I've had the most magnificent dreams, uncovering people I should reach out to, to thank people who had had a major influence on my life. And it's thanks to the our guest today, who's author of the magic of sleep thinking, how to solve problems, reduce stress and increase creativity. Eric Maisel, welcome back to the show. Hi, Aiden. Great to be back. Uh, lovely to be in Ireland. Wish I was really there. I did a, a deep writing workshop in, in Dublin not so long ago. So uh, that's a pity I missed you, man. Next time, next time. Next time. And I, I absolutely loved that we were laughing before we came on air about uh, going off piste and going down alleyways here, there, everywhere. And I was saying I absolutely love that. So there's, <laughs> there's no worries about that. Today, we're going to try and keep to the steps as much as possible. And as I mentioned in part one, we're going to try and chunk them so we can get through because Eric has a coaching client after this episode today. So we left off after step one, which was committing to self awareness. So the idea of write down what you want, get that green, dream journal, etc. The power of daily practice, which is another element of Eric's coaching. But step two is affirm your desire to answer your own questions. And you say here, I want to know why I'm doing such and such, and what I can do to change it. That's what you're affirming. And you're injecting here, as you tell us a dose of life affirming optimism into your system. And you're also awakening your brain, which operates at only a percentage of its power, when it has no tricky questions to contemplate, it needs a question to contemplate, and it can do that while we sleep. Freud had many interesting ideas and many goofy ideas. Uh, one of the interesting ideas was the idea of defense mechanisms. That strikes me, that's always struck me as true. Uh, that's what his daughter Anna ran with as the piece of Freud's theory that she found most interesting. I believe that we're defensive creatures. I think we do a good job of keeping the truth from ourselves. We know lots of things, lots of truths peek through, but there are also lots of things we don't want to know about. If we hate our job and we have to stay at it, we don't want to quite notice how much we hate it, etc. So part of the task of sleep thinking is announcing to ourselves that we want to be our less, least defensive self, most open self, most affirmative self. In traditional therapy, the goal of traditional therapy was insight. The goal of existential therapy, by contrast, which I think is interesting, is hope. Existential therapy sees hope as more important than insight. Well, both go hand in hand, and there's a third piece, which is work. But if you put those three things together, insight, hope, and work, then you have like a complete program for living or for sleep thinking. And so yes, as we as we're talking, step two is really affirming that uh, you have a chance that uh, you're giving life a thumbs up rather than considering life a cheat. Let me just put one little parenthesis there. Most people, without quite realizing it, have decided that life is a cheat, that they've been cheated by life. They thought that without really thinking it through, what do you, how can you think it through or five or six or seven, but without thinking it through, they had a picture of life as a child as being something maybe large and grand and interesting and safe and X, Y, Z. 
and then they live. And the teen, teenage years starts to shift that view. And that's why the teenage years can be so dark. And then the first 10 years of adulthood, the early 20s, we start to get a clearer and clearer picture of how hard life is. We have our failed relationships. We have our jobs we don't like. We have a car that, that isn't running and all of that. And somewhere along the line, I think we give life a thumbs down. We still go through the motions, but now we need antidepressants. Now we need this. Now we need that to make it through the day. Now we need scotch. Now we need heroin. Now we need whatever to make it through the day. So that's all by way of saying one of the tasks of learning things for yourself is to decide to give life a thumbs up because it counteracts um, the shadowy darkness inside of ourselves that is there. Those shadows are there. It's a lovely message, Eric. And I, I, I tried to keep on track. I've gone off piste already here. <laughs> what are we five minutes in? But I, I really wanted to emphasize this for anybody, because the practice of gratitude, journaling and realizing what you have for great grateful for is seen somewhat as bushy washy by some people, etc. I try to encourage that with my children at such a young age. But I think one of the ways to win them over with it is explain why and I'd love you to talk about this because when the brain is hunting for something, it's like a sniffer dog. And if you give their brain reasons to look for gratitude, it will look for more reasons for gratitude. And then it becomes a lens through which you experience life. And I'd love your thoughts on that because that's truly what I feel. And part of the brain's beliefs and biases series, I thought that'd be a lovely message to in involve today. Let me address that this way, and that is I try to teach all clients to think thoughts that serve them. It's a very straightforward phrase, but it's said carefully, because what I want clients to understand is that true thoughts may not be serving them. That a thought is true is not a reason to countenance it. I work with lots of writers. If they go into a bookstore and see lots of books, they naturally will say to themselves, wow, there are so many writers. And that's a true thought, but it's not a thought that's going to serve them because it's going to cause them to stop writing three days down the road um, just because they see so much competition and they don't feel like they have a chance. So it's very important to do this simple three-step procedure out of cognitive therapy. Notice what you're saying. Notice what you're saying. This is, again, this has to get under the radar of our defenses in order to listen because we're not wanting to hear what we're saying inside. But that step one is to actually listen, to bravely listen. Step two is to dispute those thoughts that aren't serving us, not about truth or falsity, but to say, no, I don't, I don't need that thought. I don't want that thought. That isn't a good thought for me. That almost sounds like enough. Step one, step two, hear the thought, dispute it. But then there's a step three, which is to include a new affirmation, a more affirmative thought to add a thought that then becomes the channel that your brain wants to go down from there on in. And it might be some simple global affirmation like everything's fine, or I'm doing well, or life is good, or whatever, whatever set of words it might be. But you want to have some global affirmation on hand that, that causes or allows your brain to go in that direction each time you say it. So that's a simple cognitive therapy strategy of noticing and disputing and affirming. Like all the things you and I are talking about, these are very easy to say, folks then have to do them. And that's the hard part in working with human beings is that they tend not to, they tend to maybe do these things for half an hour or a day, but then by day two, they're back to, we're back to our old habits. That's why you and I chatted about the necessity of daily practice and why the idea of daily practice is so important. It sounds like it's just a disciplined kind of thing, become more disciplined, but it really isn't about discipline. It's about helping neurons lose their grip around thoughts that aren't serving you and build new, new grips around thoughts that will serve you better. I love it. And it's, it, again, I, I just think it's so important imagine children were taught this in school, that this is how your brain works. And this is how it creates habits. This is how 
myelination works in the brain and neurons are connected, etc. Because then they can realize it's not stuck. You're not stuck the way you are. You can change it. And but the power of discipline can actually change things. I, I thought about what you said about the writers and it never dawned on me before, Eric. So I, I mentioned to you in, in part one about playing professional sport, but I was a poor, uh, like as a kid, I was, well, I wasn't very, you would have never bet on me to make it, put it that way. But one of the things I never realized until I had a kid who played sport was to your point how many you had to compete with because all I did was focus on myself and focus on the next day and the training and in, in an isolated way almost and almost with blinkers on the discipline on what I could control control the controllables and it was only when I saw the amount of kids who want that dream with my own son that I went wow I am so lucky to have got through if you think of that as a f system, if I if I had thought that way at the start, I would have just probably got inundated with thoughts and it probably would have drowned my ambition. And of course, um, there needs to be a measure of talent, um, a measure of intelligence, we need certain things in order to succeed in addition to discipline and devotion. Um, one of those areas that, that interests me is the area of the special challenges of smart people. That's not so politically correct to talk about, but nevertheless, I do believe that smart people have their own sets of challenges. I did a book called Why Smart People Hurt, and I have a book coming out in a month or two called Why Smart Teens Hurt. And um, I just think that it's, that it's important to think about ideas like talent and intelligence and proving the exception, our we have two daughters. I have a son by a previous marriage, and my wife and I have two daughters. And our older daughter was the put down your head and and be the uh, distributor midfielder in soccer. She 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 would give the ball to everyone else and put her head down and win all the um, team awards, sportsmanship awards, or effort awards. And then our younger daughter um, had more talent had a powerful kick, but she would be always staring out into, she'd be a striker, but she would never move forward. She'd always stay in the background and look out in space and be thinking thoughts. So she never wanted to make use of her talent. It was always clear that one was going to go down as an academic straight, straight road, and one was going to go down a crooked path. It doesn't mean one was better than the other in any sense, but these, these, are, the, these are the matters that we face in life manifesting our intelligence, manifesting our creativity, making use of our talents. All of that is part of what we're talking about here. I'm really looking forward to that book because I have why people smart people hurt. And I think it's it's fantastic because Eric and I debated which one we'd go with. And we decided to go with the magic of sleep thinking back onto that track. now for the moment. <laughs> Step three, as they say, with 40 minutes to go is of 18, by the way, is to brainstorm current issues and questions. So many people who experience this, they go, I, I, I don't know what to ask. And you go, well, very few people do, but you need to do the brainstorming here. So I'll hand it over to you to tell us about this step. Let's, let's just flesh that out. But let's, let, let's take one of my typical clients, let's say a visual artist, um, who's, who, who wants a better career, who wants more of her artwork to sell. Well, that's easy enough to say. But it's hard to form the right sleep thinking question from the feeling that your career is not going well. You could create the question, what's wrong with my career? But it may be, it feels to me a little unlikely that that's going to be the, the opening salvo of a good connection. Probably a little too generic and a little maybe even off, off track to ask it that way. So what, what I'm inviting folks to do is to bring step one, that self-awareness, to step two, three, four, five, et cetera, and think through before even creating the sleep thinking prompt or question, just think through what's really going on. Let me, let me switch um, examples for a second. I work with coaches all the time. I train coaches. Um, one of the biggest problem coaches have and don't know that they have is they don't actually want to work with human beings. 
they like the idea of coaching, but they actually find it scary to sit across from someone and coach. So if, if a coach were to say to me, I, I don't, I want clients, I might help that coach get closer to the right sleep thinking question, which might be, do I actually want clients? That's probably the right sleep thinking question or prompt. When the right sleep thinking prompt is applied, then really good answers come. And if that coach is thinking that, if is delivering that question to his brain, do I really want questions? Within one evening, I, I would bet he or she would come to the realization that he doesn't want clients and he has to work on that. And that the next steps are about maybe bravery or anxiety management or talking himself into the belief that it's okay to sit across from people, et cetera. This is a long-winded way of saying we have to break down sort of generic big questions like my life sucks. That's too big a matter to put into a sleep thinking prompt. We have to look at that in our waking hours and try to figure out what the right sleep thinking prompt might be. I'm going to try and chunk some of these, as I said, to, so we try and get through through the steps because yeah. I put step four and five together. Step four is is related to three, obviously, it says identify particular issues and questions to focus on. So in a way, the brainstorming is diverge, and then you converge into something to focus on particularly, and then you write it into your journal, I'll let you elaborate on this again. But then step five is a goal of sleep thinking and the entire program is to reduce the stress of anxiety in life altogether, particularly at nighttime. And, and this is one of the things Eric, I found was, when I actually had a much better night routine night habit, my dreams were better, my sleep was better, my thinking was better the following day. And even stuff like my diet was better the next day, because I wasn't craving sugar, because I had had such a poor sleep. Maybe you'll unpack these two steps together. Well, I think we can tie actually these two steps and maybe two or three of the forthcoming steps together just as a little routine that we can picture. It's easy to picture this routine. Somewhere during the day or somewhere during the week, you have posed yourself a big question and then broken it down to try to understand what the right sized sleep thinking question might be. So that's that's preliminary work done somewhere in the day. If, you, if it's your current style to stay up very late um, uh, or to drink a lot in the evening or to do X, Y, Z that is not really supporting good sleep habits, well, naturally, you would want to think through whether there are things to change there. If, if there are new changes to your routine to make that support this desire to learn from your sleep, from your sleeping brain. What will get in the way of you changing your routine or posing yourself a sleep thinking question or doing any of this work is anxiety. As I think I said in the last chat, I'll say it again, we all need one or two or three portable anxiety management strategies that actually work. The simplest one is some deep breathing. One that I've done a whole book on is called, the book is called 10 Zen Seconds and the idea is to drop useful thought into a deep breath call them incantations. It's a very simple idea. It's really dropping an affir affirmation into a breath and just using that as a relaxing charm, so to speak. But whatever it is you know to do, hopefully you know to do something to reduce your anxiety so that you're going to bed less anxious than most people currently are. This insomnia epidemic that we have is about anxiety, people going to bed worried or not being able to go to bed because they are worried. So we're, I'm, we're saying a lot fast here, but there's some work to be done right then before going to bed in reducing one's experience of anxiety right there. Then you pose as gently as you can your sleep thinking prompt. As we mentioned the other time, my phrase for this is, have a wonder rather than a worry. You're trying to get to that sort of childhood place of wondering why the sky is blue rather than worried about is the sky blue. That wondering place, that's the way to deliver the sleep thinking prompt up is as a wonder. Then there's a kind of release, kind of relaxation that's needed where you're allowing your brain to think. You would think that any human being would allow her brain to think, why not? But actually we, we get in the habit, especially 
given how school works, to not think. There are lots of injunctions against thinking in childhood. We're supposed to know facts. We're supposed to draw inside the lines. We're supposed to know what's on the test. There's lots of stuff we're supposed to know. None of that's about thinking. And if you try to bring up at the dinner table some big thought, everybody in the family is going to say, stop that. We don't want to talk about world peace or is there a God or please, none of that. Just pass the potatoes, please. So there are lots of injunctions around thinking. So part of the sleep thinking program is getting, gaining some new permission to think, which is easy here because you're turning it over to your sleeping brain. So it's not like you have to think hard. So there's that permission giving. Then there's some surrender through the night and some lack of worry about getting answers. It would seem funny that a person wouldn't want to get answers to her own questions, but we have that kind of problem where we, I've had lots of clients who said, my God, what if I wake up in the middle of the night with a thought? To which my reply is, that, that's lovely, Jane. Jane, that's lovely. That's not you waking up with a nightmare or a worry. That's you waking up with an actual thought. So write it down. Do a little work on your novel or do a little problem solving. And parenthetically, this sleep thinking program provokes better sleep and you will wake up only very rarely with an answer. So, so try not to worry about this program waking you up too often with good ideas. But even if it did wake you up, it would be with answers, and that would be a good thing. But so now we have kind of a gentle deep sleeping where in non-REM sleep you're thinking, in REM sleep you're dreaming. This is your brain having a wonderful night doing both things. Now I know we're, we're leaping ahead, but I think we're kind of appropriately moving because it's just the rhythm. It's a very natural rhythm. Now you have to go somewhere and process the night. Nowadays it would be to your computer screen, but it could be with your notebook in bed. You don't have to hop out of bed and go anywhere to do this. But what you want to do is kind of repeat. Repeat's a loose word here, but I'll just use it. Sort of repeat your sleep thinking prompt question from the night before. Let's say you were working on a novel and let's say the question had been, I wonder what Mary wants to say to John in chapter three. Maybe that's what your three sleep thinking question had been. Just ask it again. I wonder what Mary wants to say to John in chapter three. and my hunch is that you will be able to just take dictation, that Mary and John will have had their conversation through the night, and now you can just write it down and have it available. Maybe not the first night. Maybe, the, maybe it's the third night, and we've already talked about give this a chance. But if you give it a chance, then by turning to your notebook or your computer screen or your file, directly after waking, then whatever your brain has been working on will be available to you and you can have the answers you were hoping for. Go to bed with a wonder, not a worry. That has a few connotations, I thought. One was that you're kind of going, hmm, I wonder why that happened. Not, I need to find out why this happened and you're almost dictating to your brain that you need an answer. But the other wonder I felt was the, it, it also suggests the, the state of mind you're in of you're not in a worried state of mind because when we're in that moment of just about to fall asleep in the theta wave of the brain most people are thinking about their dread of the following day or the, the day to come or and, and then we do the same thing in the morning so we're removing these two extremely important parts of the day from from our lives essentially we're done we're, it's like we're turning down the volume on them i'd love your thoughts on that by trying to get to that state, which is not a state, not a heightened state, it's it's actually a, a calmer, quieter state. We talked about neuronal gestalt in, in the last chat about every thought grabbing neurons. So what we're really talking about here, about this wondering, is really letting go of all of the small thoughts that have been pestering us and all of the new small thoughts that are now pestering us as we are in bed letting go of all of those gripped neurons and coming to the quiet place of essentially empty mind, which is the equivalent of having your whole mind. Empty mind is exactly the same as the equivalent of now all of your billions of neurons are 
relaxed, so to speak. They've, re they've released their grip from each other and they're pregnant. They're waiting for the next thing. And if the next thing can be a light wonder, rather, if, if the next thing is a worry, then it'll, then all those neurons will start going back to their small places of how are my stocks doing and, and are, are croissants good anymore? Or My cryptocurrencies. <laughs> your cryptocurrencies. I exactly. All of that. So, so right then and there, you have this beautiful opportunity of having your whole brain available for what is just the briefest of times until all of our bad habits, all of our bad thought habits will come back and go back to cryptocurrencies and stock market and this or that. So we, that's when we get to do, right then we get to do this wondering, have this wonder. For me right now, um, I started out in, as, a, as a physics boy. Physics, math, astronomy interested me as a kid. And then I stopped being interested in all of that. But now I'm coming back around to wondering what time is. <laughs> Those kinds of wonders. I'm watching physics videos now. I'm not worried about time. <laughs> this is not a worry about, oh my God, what's the nature of the universe? It's just, I'm just curious about uh, big objects and time, the difference, time going more slowly around large objects, all of that's interesting to me. So I'm trying to communicate what wondering feels like. It's not the same as worrying. And if a person could get there, if a person could get to that place at night of wondering, he or she would get a whole body of work done over time. This is not just about finding an answer to a creative question for the next day. This is a methodology for, my hands are going like this because I, I always do this. This is a bookshelf. This, this is a body of work. This is lots of books done. Rather than just the narrowest, I answered a plot problem in this book. It's if I sleep, think every night and turn to my work first thing every day, I will build a body of work over time for sure. It also speaks to what we talked about in part one. And I wanted to connect the dot here is that what you're talking about there is this, the, the wondering is essentially curiosity. And if you're devoted, you'll be disciplined. And you talked about that, that duality of devotion and discipline in part one, and Pavarotti's great saying. But th this is where, like, I often get people asking me about I'm thinking of doing a podcast, and I go, you, you gotta, you gotta love your subject, you gotta love what you're doing, because there'll be days you just won't want to do it. And you you won't read the book. And the you, as you know, Eric, you've been interviewed many, many times, you can smell it a mile away with the when the interviewer hasn't, <laughs> hasn't read your book as well. And I, I think that's almost an insult to the to the author as well. But you, I love doing this. I, this is my wonder, I, I sometimes feel I could read the book twice or three times. Let, let me piggyback on that. Because there are lots of things we ought to do in life that we don't necessarily love doing and that don't provoke the experience of meaning. We would like life to feel meaningful, but there are many things we have to do in life that don't necessarily feel meaningful. Let's say we're an activist and there's some cause that matters to us. Let's just say climate change, let's say. And this week, we're essentially just sending out the same email thousand times over to various people. That's our job this week as an activist. Nothing exciting about it. We're not even we're not in love with that process of sitting there, sending out another email, sending out another email. And we may not be getting the experience of meaning that whole week long. So it's hard to sit there under those circumstances, not being in love with the activity, not getting meaning from the activity. Why are we sitting there? Because we're living our life purposes. That's why I always want to send people back around to the idea of what's important for us to be, what makes us proud of our own efforts. That's actually more important than the experience of meaning or the experience of love or the experience of devotion or the experience of anything is coming back around to living our life purposes. The example I give all the time, and I'll just share it here, is in the days before D-Day, we don't really care what mood Eisenhower is in. We don't care if he's anxious. We don't care if he's depressed. We need him to get the invasion right. We just need him to do his job. And we don't experience life that way as if we have an invasion coming. We don't have a D-Day coming, but we should. 
that is the way we should experience our life, is that the next thing we're doing is important to us, of course, not to Martians, not to Venusians, not to a billion people, but important to us. And therefore, let's pay a little less attention to our mood, a little less attention to whether we're, whether we're feeling good or not, a little less attention to whether life is feeling meaningful, and much more attention to let me live my life purposes. I think it was Virgil said, quick, death cometh, hurry up. And that is our D-Day, it really is coming. And, and I think we should uh, live that way. You know, I, I do, I really do think minimize regrets in life is, is, is a great goal to minimize the regrets you have. And I, I'm gonna get back onto the narrative because there's a, there's a thing I, I've shared it with, I've shared um, the magic of sleep thinking with a couple of people so far, Eric, and they've tried it and they're like, going, wow, day one had magical dreams. And, and some were able to, uh, the, the mental model I had was panning for gold. So you've loads and loads of stuff there. But the next step is like, going, well, how do you decipher what's useful and what's meaningful, because it can be confusing, and this can put people off in the early stages. The answer is built into the question, which is you have to stay put with the material that has arisen and continue the self-awareness, self-inquiry part of this process and try to try to discern what, try to tease out an intention. It's sort of step one, just to say it very simply, tease out an intention. I intend to do X. Then the, the two next steps are to align your thoughts with that intention, to start thinking the thoughts that serve that intention and to align behaviors with that intention. Here are the actions I mean to take. So it's very straightforward, but it's just a certain kind of work. Here's this massive material that I've maybe generated. A lot of people who journal then allow that massive material to just sit there and they don't process it. It's unprocessed. And the next day they have another massive material and the end of 30 years, they have a thousand journals, all unprocessed, which is, which is fine in its own way. But if you're trying to solve problems or write books or what have you, then each day you want to deal with the material that you've generated. You may have gotten a very clear answer, then there's nothing more to say, then you know what to do, then you then have to do it, but then you know what to do. But it may be much more complicated and disguised and metaphoric and what have you. And then you just have to stay put say to yourself, I'm going to, I'm going to find it. I'm going to pull it. I'm going to tease an intention out of this. And then I'm going to align my thoughts and my behaviors with that intention. The, um, now, by, by the way, I just want to say one other thing. And that is, there's no magic to, there's no magic to this, except, except the magic of staying put. Th that is what, that's the magic here. It's, it's the magic of not rushing on to the day. Just parenthetically, in people's real lives, an awful lot of people can't turn to this sleep thinking processing because they need to check their email first. That's like the reality or, or their phone first. That's just where we are. People sort of can't get out of the habit of not checking their email or their phone or their something first, which of course is not good for the process. But if that's your reality, my suggestion to a person who's in that set of circumstances is to just look to put out fires. That is not really look at your email, just glance. If there's something you must attend to, okay, attend to it really fast. If your business depends on it, if your life depends on it, okay, pay attention to it. But move through it quickly so that you can get through the processing. There's a way in which we can do certain things that feel like interruptions just as long as we're still holding that basic goal or, or promise of getting to the sleep thinking processing, if we're holding that basic goal, then we can even deal with some interruptions like checking email a little bit or letting the dog out or what have you, a few things. That's all allowable as long as basically we're getting to the work. Or feed the cats as you used to have to do. <laughs> the cats were for the kids. And when the kids grew up, the cats went away. So you have more time to sleep think but uh, or to process and so I, I, the next two are going to chunk together We're on 13 and 14. So we've jumped right ahead. Because there's that great saying, which is fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And you say, if and you've covered this slightly here already, and 
don't bother with it if you have you said plan for any necessary work or change planning is an important part of sleep thinking program the plan you make can be very simple as simple as identifying two or three steps you mean to take to make a change or do the work suggested by your sleep thoughts that's 13 14 then is accomplish the work or make the changes it's one thing to make the plan and it's another thing to act on the plan let me take this a little obliquely obviously we know what we're saying here and yes the simpler the plan the better for a writer the best plan is i write that's the best plan the second you add details like 500 words or an hour or what have you you're less likely to get the work done it's just what happens in life so the simpler the plan the more sort of powerfully simple the plan the better but let's turn to the work so in my model of life of how we get to do the next right thing one thing after another and live our life purposes in my model of life each day is a negotiation and it's an it's a negotiation around our life purposes not our to-do list not, not that to-do list that's always there of take the car to the garage or whatever so i mean so i'm going to say a lot of things quickly but if we can identify our life purposes, what's important to us, and understand which we can get to in a daily way and which must be more intermittent because of their nature, then each day we can partition part of the day to our life purposes and have other parts of the day just be what I call meaning neutral. That is just stuff we have to get done. Time when we don't pester ourselves about the meaningfulness of life, we just get stuff done. So the way to get the work done that has arisen from our sleep thinking is to negotiate each day very carefully to know what, and, and this is very boring to a young person, actually very boring to every human being. Do I really have to set up my day this carefully? Yes. If your intention is to live your life purposes with an S, that means there are many things you're trying to get to. And you know, we know that if you don't put them on your daily to-do list, a year will have vanished and you won't have gotten to life purpose X or life purpose Y. It just will be off your radar entirely for that whole year. So this is all by way of saying when, when, when we're talking about getting work done and organization and planning, what we're talking about is a very careful way of spending each day which may not suit one's sort of spontaneity place or inspirational place or what have you, but it's the way to live a life that makes us proud. So what I'm suggesting here to our audience, Eric, is buy a copy of the book and follow the practices and the examples there, and then hopefully use these two episodes as prompts from the man himself, the, the author of that book as a ways to bring it to life as you're reading those separate little sections. Step 15 of 18 is to keep track of your progress. Because as Eric said, you do want to keep track, but you want to take the action. And here you say in your sleep thinking journal, you'll be making many kinds of entries, you'll record meaningful dreams, issues that are present in your life, sleep thoughts, plans for change, and so on. You'll also want to keep track of your progress as you work to solve program pro problems. This ongoing self analysis serves as a record of your progress and alerts you to any new or additional work that may be needed. This is a key step in any type of transformation. Let me say a couple of different things about that. <laughs> Number one, progress is a complicated word. In, in the United States, it's built, it's baked in to our psyche, progress. The transcendental poets of the 19th century, Emerson, Thoreau, felt that that was the American mandate, was to make progress. And their, their image was the image of the upward spiral, where we're supposed to be going forward and upward. And so Americans especially, but I think the whole whole developed world has this idea that we're supposed individually we're supposed to be making progress. We have to be careful because process doesn't always allow for progress. If it's the case that we're, I don't know, playing the piano and today we must go over the same chord a thousand times, and by the end of that hour, we're actually playing it more poorly than we started out, that has to be okay. We didn't make progress in that hour, 
but we honored the process in that hour. So I wanted to make a, a distinction for your viewers between process and progress. Progress is not the whole game. Process is as important as progress. So that's just to underline that point. Then when it comes to progress, we also have to be very clear about how our life purpose choices may change. Which means that we can't expect pure progress in one direction if a life purpose choice has changed. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say that we've named health as one of our life purposes. So we, we want to improve our health, whatever that might mean to us. And then that day, our son comes to us and says, I need a kidney. Suddenly, health is going, our health is going to recede on our list of life purpose choices. And, and giving donating a kidney to our child is going to come up higher. Something very profound has shifted with respect to our life purpose choices in that second. So we can't really think about making progress with respect to our health as a linear thing because we're going to be harming our health by undergoing surgery for the sake of a reason we know we're, we mean to do. So that's, that's a long-winded way of saying we have to be flexible in our understanding of progress and, and go deep into this idea of life purpose choosing because we're, we're dancing every day with our life purpose choices, especially with the state of the world that affects what our life purpose choices are on a given day. We may have wished not to be an activist and then the world becomes what it is and we decide I better be a resistance fighter this year. That may be more important than writing another poem this year. Things shift and change by virtue of our understanding of how the world is going. I'm panning away here. There's gold everywhere, Eric. And we're coming towards the end, the last three steps. And I don't want to finish there. I, I'd like just a couple of things, which is you've been doing this for such a long time. And this relates to step 16, because step 16 is sleep, think new issues and questions, because you say some issues may not get resolved easily which may force you to think them in new and different ways. Some will get resolved completely, but then another problem requiring sleep thinking will grab your attention and rear its head. And it made me think you say that sleep thinking is a lifelong self help ter therapy. You've been obviously doing this for a very long time. And how has your own sleep thinking evolved to this point of step 16? Let me give you a concrete example of something that I'll be dealing with till the end of time, no doubt. Um, many years ago, probably in the, in the mid 1980s, 1990s, a long time ago, I had done a, a, a string of successful books with Tartar Publishing, Fearless Creating and some other books. And I was giving carte blanche to do a book. And I decided to do a book on meaning this is, pro this is at least 35 years ago, let's say. But I had no idea what I was saying. I had, I had no idea what I wanted to say about meaning. I just wanted to do a book about meaning. So I got a nice advance to write a book about meaning. And I wrote a really, really bad book about meaning, which was unpublishable. They could not. My editor was lovely and said, Eric, this is there are interesting bits here, but what in God's name are you talking about? And this doesn't work at all, and we can't possibly publish this. This is this is all by way of saying answers may not be available now. The question may be very clear in a certain sense. The question was clear to me. I want to understand meaning better. There was a question, but the answer was not available to me 35 years ago. I was still had to rummage around all kinds of different thinking to get to my ways of talking about meaning now that I like. Now, 35 years later, I can talk about, I can give you an hour presentation on meaning that makes some sense, but I couldn't do that then. So that's one of the things we're talking about is that the answer may not be available Einstein may have an intuition 
about the relationship between energy and matter, but not have E equals MC squared until he has it. So he could sleep, think, what's the relationship between energy and matter night after night after night after night after night after night and not get there till he gets there. That's frustrating, isn't it? And that's actually one of the frustrations of intelligence is to pose oneself a question that one can't answer. Right? Well, if you're doing string theory, how many strings are there? Who knows? But you could pester yourself about how many strings there are in the universe. So that's all by way of saying this has to be an ongoing process with lots of latitude, lots of self-forgiveness, lots of ease in understanding that as beautiful as this mechanism is, that doesn't mean we're getting a proper answer every, every Monday morning. That's not what this is about. This is, this is a tool, a help to allow oneself to continue one's journey through life, understanding more and more as we go forward. And it links to what you said in part one, as well as like this work, it takes work to work on yourself to creativity takes work as well. And this is part of that work. One of the last steps is step 17, which is, you can bring the fundamentals of sleep thinking into your daytime. So I alluded to this in part one, where I was saying one of the things that intrigued me was I'd read about David Bohm, for example, and how he used to sleep think although he didn't call it that, but like go to sleep in a, in a chamber of quiet, write down a question and then fall, fall asleep. And we've read a few times inventors doing that. So that's part 17. And because you're running out of time. So I want to try and get 18 in there as well. 18 then is really brings it all together. And that's about living an examined life. So maybe you'll, you'll kill two birds with the one stone or maybe <laughs> kills the wrong one maybe uh, is uh, feed two birds with the one so many aphorisms you can't use anymore yeah well let, let me paint a little picture so we go through the day probably in a rush um, being too busy maybe getting tired so what we want to do is acquire the habit of stopping not just slowing down, but actually stopping and creating quiet, which is that activity of loosening neuronal grip of all those small thoughts that are pestering us right in that moment, 17 more calls to make or 14 more emails to send or whatever it is. Get quiet. To maybe create, and this is an exercise in one of my books, I think Fearless Creating, perhaps create kind of a permeable bubble around ourselves of quiet so that we keep the world out for a while. It's permeable so that we can notice if our kids are crying or if the water's boiling or something. We don't want to be completely divorced from the world. So it's maybe semi-permeable. But we're in a bubble of silence. And that's essentially the equivalent of sleep thinking because what we're doing in sleep thinking is inviting our whole brain to think. That's what we get during the night is our whole brain. And so we can do that during the day. We can create, create, we can invite our brain to let go of all of its associations and be available for, if nothing else, a little peace. Maybe it's available for some work. Maybe there's a piece of work we want to invite it to do. Maybe we have an, a difficult email to send and we want our whole brain available to write that email. But this isn't always about working. There's a doing part to all of this, but there's also a being part. And so just by allowing ourselves to get quiet for some seconds, a mini meditation moment, get quiet for some, we reacquire the day that way. We're not pulled by the nose through our day. We, we are in better charge of our day. If we can learn this habit, if we can call it waking sleep thinking or, or hushing or holding or different ways to say this thing that we're talking about. But what it's about is stopping and getting quiet, sort of demanding of our small thoughts to go away for a while. Go, go away, small thoughts. I'd like my brain for a bit. I'd like my whole brain for a bit. Then the last one I'll maybe tee you up as a finale now is to live an examined life. So I mean, this is what it's all about as far as you're concerned, all your work is about helping your clients and helping humanity think better and in, indeed in doing so helping yourself. So Eric, I'm gonna tee that one up for you. And 
two things before I do, because I want to leave the final word with you. One is, I have a quote that I picked, a short quote, just to thank you, a quote I love from the book. But before I even go there, where can people find out about you? Because you do sleep thinking co coaching, you do other coaching, you do the writers uh, uh, workshops, etc. Let's tell people about what you offer and where they can find you. By visiting my site is the best place to know what's going on in my life. That's ericmazel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. I train creativity coaches three times a year in, in online, 16-week online trainings that start every February, June, and September. So if anybody out there is curious about creativity coaching, um, those trainings are available. I also work individually with clients, and all of that information is at my site. Just as a side note, I have lots of books out and coming out. Um, one is Why Smart Teens Hurt that we chatted about. One that just came out that I like is Redesign Your Mind. But I wanted to mention the two books that maybe we mentioned briefly, I don't know if we did or not, that just came out from Ethics International Press where I'm the lead editor on the Ethics International Press Critical Psychology and Critical Psychiatry series. And those two books just came out. And one is called uh, Critiquing the Psychiatric Model, and the other is called Humane Alternatives to the Psychiatric Model. So if anybody out there is curious about alternative ways of thinking about the mental disorder paradigm, which is a bad paradigm, if anybody's interested in thinking about other ways to look at that, then I invite them to take a look at those two Ethics International Press books. And congrats on that, Eric. I was unaware of that myself. My final quote before I hand to you to close today's show is, you already sleep think, since everyone is a sleep thinker, but you may not be formally working the sleep thinking program yet. If you aren't, that's understandable. Maybe you didn't see its value, or maybe you didn't feel motivated to do the required work. Or maybe spending an hour first thing each morning with a journal seemed way too hard. But I wonder, you asked the question, if you'd be willing to give it a go for a week and see what happens. That's the way I wanted to finish today's show and throw that gauntlet out to our audience. And Eric, what about you? What's your final message for our audience? I want to say this as quickly as I can, given time, but... I was born right after World War II, and World War II, the Holocaust, all of that was on the minds of everybody around me as I was growing up. And the idea of being a resistance fighter struck me, struck a chord with me very early on in life. And I, I think that I think we all need to find that part of our psyche, part of our being right now to um, resist all of the things that are going on that are not okay. This is not really a sleep thinking last word. This is a life last word about what's needed from us. I hope that one of our life purpose choices, as I say, there is not one purpose to life. And if on a given day you want to watch television or have some um, good Irish whiskey or whatever it is you want to do, that's perfectly fine. But I hope that one of our life purpose choices is to resist what's not okay. That's kind of where I'd like to leave people author of a multitude of titles he's mentioned some of them there but the focus of these two episodes the magic of sleep thinking how to solve problems reduce stress and increase creativity while you sleep eric mazel thank you for your time thanks so much for having me before we finish today's episode i want to thank our sponsor zai boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. I'll see you very soon.